Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we are in Vicksburg, Mississippi and we are visiting the USS Cairo. Before we go inside the museum, I wanted to stop at a few of the outdoor stops, including this one right here that talks a little bit more about the Brown Water Navy. It shows us a few of the different kinds of ships that you might have found cruising up and down the Mississippi at this time. And in 1861, the United States Navy was faced with the daunting task of actually controlling the Mississippi River and taking it from the Confederacy. Now, there were few ships that were actually capable of doing this. And so we can see here that some of the different ships that would would have been cruising up and down that were capable of navigating these waters would have been seen here. However, today we are going to be visiting one that is very special. It was an ironclad. This is what an ironclad would have looked like in its heyday when it was all put together. And again, the ship that we're looking at today has been dredged up from the bottom of the river. Now the one featured on this sign is called the Essex and it was actually 640 tons. It was huge. It was mammoth, it was so big, and yet it could navigate down the Mississippi and do the things that it needed to do. Now these ships were loaded down with an artillery of so many different things. And we're about to go see some cannons and you can actually walk through the ship area so you could see what it would have been like to be in that space at that time. And so this is gonna be kind of interesting, but a few other things that you will want to know from the Vicksburg area. Whenever we came to the Welcome Center, whenever we first arrived here, there was this high point for which you could find a cannon. And the cannon actually overlooked the Mississippi. And this area that they had was a stronghold for the Confederacy and they would literally try to commandeer anything that was going into the Mississippi River through this area. And in doing so, what would happen is as they would navigate through, they would take down these ships which would supply the troops and also be part of the commerce of the United States. And so their goal was to cripple the North from the South and to make it extremely difficult for them to navigate or even use these ports. And so the ironclads became a stronghold for the North in this situation because they were robust and filled with so many different pieces that could help them to navigate through this Confederate area and potentially take out some of those cannons. Now with that said, let's go explore. Just at the base of the museum walkway, we find this sign saying that this is the last of its kind. On December 12th, 1862, this ironclad was actually sunk in the Yazoo River while mine clearing. And so you can see here where the museum that we were about to go into is and also you can see where the historic driving tour happens to be that leads you all the way down to the visitor center for the larger park as a whole and it's kind of interesting to see because these historic photos really give you context as to how many people would fit on these ships what it would have looked like as they navigated and then also you can see what the boat ended up looking like for a short time before the recovery and restoration began. Now inside the museum itself, you have lots of information about what it took to get this here, but also the artifacts that they were able to recover from the rivers. And that includes everything from cannons to small pieces and everything in between. There's also an instructional video that tells you a little bit more about the location. I always encourage you guys to check out any kind of information they have at the national parks, just because they do give you context for the places that you're visiting. So when you're looking at them, you can already in your mind see how these things would have worked in the bigger picture. I think that seeing the background and discovering the history of the items before you look at them is super helpful, especially in sections of battlefields where it might just be a big open space now. So with that said, this thing is big. This thing is, is, is really, really big. I was not expecting it to be quite this large. This is in the 1800s that this, this was developed. And, and typically we don't think about ironclads in the 1800s. We think of that as more of a like 1900s thing, but no, no it is not. It is insane to see the size of this and to think that it sunk at only 36 feet of water. It looks 
so big but it was also a weighty weighty beast of a boat and you can imagine that with all of that weight once a hole allows the water to start rushing in it would go down quite quickly but wow to see the recovery of this is just spectacular and something that should be on everyone's bucket list just because it is a feat of like engineering for them to even be able to extract something like this from the waterway, yet another reason to come to Mississippi. But also to see that the history plays out and you can see the old pieces that they've recovered and the new pieces that they've integrated to make it safe for us to go and view. It's very, very neat. Okay, I did a little bit of math because we were just looking at this sign right here. And this sign actually says that they built seven ironclads in only a hundred days. And they had to meet this deadline, otherwise they had to pay $200 a day in overages and late fees. So this is the guy right here who did this. And it says that each one of these ironclads cost an average of $101,808 which led me to figuring out the math and seeing that that would equate to over $3 million today. Okay, this is kind of interesting because they have their accessibility with the braille on it and you can see and feel this map, which is really cool. It shows you that the Mississippi River is running along here and this is the Vicksburg area, but the sinking location was just north of Vicksburg, just a little bit on the Yazoo River. So that's a tributary to the Mississippi and you can learn a little bit more about that through the sign that they have that talk about the actual torpedoing and also the sinking. Now this sign right here was one of the more fascinating ones though because you can see here it's marking a chimney. Well here they actually have some large wooden pillars that resemble the chimney. However, a fun interesting fact about this that was shared again in the sign is that the wooden stacks that we see are actually skeletal reproductions that hold a value of showing us significantly where those would have been. However, because the water wasn't super deep, whenever the boat went down, the chimneys were still visible. So actually a sister boat, the Pittsburgh, came and knocked down those chimneys so that they wouldn't be able to recover the contents of the ship by being able to find its physical location. Because if the Confederates would have done that, that would have given them even more weapons to use and more ammunition. So instead they knocked down these green pillared chimneys and they concealed the location completely, making it stealth under the water. Now, why is this important? Well, I learned at other battlefields that any time that the forces would beat the other side, whether it was north or south, what would happen is most of the time they would seize their weapons and start using them. And so if they were to have captured a huge boat like this, it was loaded to the tilt with so much ammunition and firepower that they could have had a lot to work with in way of their missions against the North. And so it was very important to conceal this so that they wouldn't have that extra little piece because if they did, that could have been a make or break moment for the entirety of the Civil War. It's interesting to see how one battlefield works into another battlefield works into another battlefield and how you learn from each one of those sites and then you can apply them to the places that you go so you can get the entirety of the story. I always encourage people to learn from the past so we can make better tomorrows and part of doing that is visiting historic sites like this so we can learn and become better involved in the historic process so we can understand the value of things like the ship and how big of a deal it really was in our country's history. Now, as we move inside the boat, you can actually walk around a little bit and they tell us a little bit more about the function of the actual boat itself. And this is called Full Steam Ahead. This was actually a steam driven paddle wheel, which you can see in the back, back there. It had an oscillating arm and a piston, which you can see in front of us right here. And this would make it actually go down the river and they could speed it up or slow it down based on the amount of output of this region of the ship. But how? Well, they used boilers. They used five large boilers. And these boilers actually were heated with coal and could produce quite a bit of power to move really quickly despite the weight of the ship itself. In fact, these boilers right here could go through 2,000 pounds of coal 
per hour, which meant that on top of all of the very heavy cannons, on top of the very large steam equipment itself, they also were carrying quite a bit of coal. Now from that, the heat inside the boiler would actually turn everything into steam and then that would power the boat. Again, showing that this boat was not a lightweight ship. This was a very heavy, beasty ship in the midst of this time, making it one of the more powerful and impactful vessels, which is why this was so important. Now, as we walk through the, the halls of this area and we see the bare bones, which have been reconstructed for us, you can look down and see the actual wood from the ship and you can see the actual placement of the cannons. Now these cannons were kind of wild because if you've never seen a cannon before, they don't just boom and you're done. They kick back quite a bit. So every time that they would fire, they would kick back and have to be pushed back into place and then fire again. And this process would just be ongoing. And so you can see some little slides where it could slide backward just a little bit. And it's kind of fascinating to see it in this context and just how many actual guns were on this ship and how much firepower they had at any given time. So now that we understand how the boat itself worked, who was actually manning the boat? Who was on this? Well, believe it or not, most of these boats were actually powered by immigrants. And it says in this little display right here that if you stepped on board these ships, you might have heard a variety of different languages from across many nationalities. Because ultimately, the United States, we are a melting pot. And so I think it's really fascinating to see how so many of the immigrants that were in this area were actually served as a part of these forces on these huge boats like this. But there's actually a little bit more information that I wanted to share with you because I think this is one of the more fascinating points of the story of this ship. So here you can find a photo that would have been some of the different people. And you can see here that there are black people, there are white people, there are farmers, teachers, butchers. They had no sailing experience previous to getting on these boats and had to learn every single function. In total, there were 158 sailors and 17 officers on this single boat and they have some of the unique little artifacts that they have found as well as one of the sailor rolls featured right here on this sign. Now it's kind of interesting because the Union sailors were fighting for the survival of the country that they had moved to and called home through their immigration process and so many of them were very interested in the best interest of the North because ultimately they wanted to preserve what had welcomed them in with open arms. Ultimately, again, the United States, we're a melting pot and that's what's brought each and every one of us here. We can each trace our heritage to another place, each and every one of us. We call ourselves Americans, but ultimately we all started out somewhere else. So I think that that's the interesting portion of this that we all get to learn from is that our heritage, no matter where it was from, came together and culminated in this one moment to save something that they believed in. And I think that that's kind of an impressive story of why that places like this are important. We can all see ourselves through the eyes of someone else. And we can also learn from the eyes of the others to kind of see where they came from contextually. I've been to many Civil War sites and along the way I've noticed that people have come into the war for various reasons. Some people genuinely just wanted to fight the good fight or fight for whatever they believed in. And in other places, they would fight for preservation of their land or to keep the few things that they had, or, you know, to be able to live the American dream the way that we all would like to ultimately. And so I think it's interesting to see things like this because they really do tell us the true history and the brain wrinkles that we can receive from these kinds of places are so valuable to each of us as Americans. So now that we know who was here, what were they doing? What were their jobs? Well, right here it says, look up. And the circle of sloping iron plates overhead is actually shielding the pilot house. Now up in this area, they would steer the gunboat and also the officers would keep a watchful eye through these little openings that you can see in the shadows there. That would be how they would know if someone was coming up or they had anything they needed to navigate through. Just past that, we find the capstan and you can see what it looks like right here and how it would have worked. And also that there would have been a rope wrapped around it. Now you can see it here 
and you can see what it looks like in its non-functional form. This was actually a powerful winch that helped the crew be able to haul up heavy lines and also move the guns on the gun deck. This was a way that they could take these giant pieces that were way too heavy for the average man to move and make it happen through a series of cranks and then also gears. Here we learn more about the armor plating, but more impressively, we get to see what that would have looked like right on this side right here. There is a section of armor that also has the cannon guards on it, where the cannons kind of fit through this little tiny bitty hole right here. But why was it coated in all of this heavy plating? Well, believe it or not, each one of these panels was two and a half inches thick, and it was backed up by these white oak beams, which we could see in the infrastructure on the inside, and those would back up the iron. So even if the iron was hit by a cannon or other kind of artillery, what would happen is those would reinforce it so it would kind of bounce back just a little bit. Now those beams were anywhere between 12 and 25 inches thick each. So you have this giant plating on top of a very structurally balanced wooden frame, making it quite an interesting thing to maneuver down the waters because again of its weight, but also a bit harder to sink. So the fact that they were able to sink it was quite a big deal. They were using some very high powered things in order to do that, which should go to the bigger picture of just how strong cannonballs really can be. Now the cannon would fit in these little areas that could be maneuvered and opened up so that they could change things out so they could work on them or so that they could open up for more airflow. They could also be closed in with these little latches that you see and the cannon itself had a perfect place that it would come out to protect the people who were behind it but also to have the fire power be able to come out and you can see that all down through this area. So if you're looking around the boat and saying, where's the rest of it? It's very hard to raise anything from the waters once it's been there, especially if it's been damaged. So the pieces that we are seeing that have been raised took a lot of effort to get them to even go back into a structure that might look intact. How exactly did they steer? Well, we saw the pilot's house. We already had kind of looked into that and seen how that they were able to visualize what was in front of them. But believe it or not, because this is a paddle wheel, they also had a little rudder, which they have now restored Stored. and the rudders on either side of the paddle wheel steered the actual gunboat. After the pilot would make the moves to steer, he would come back here and the rudder would ultimately be responsible for that movement. Now the rudder wouldn't work without the act of the paddle wheel inside, which we could see from one view, but now we can see it from a different view. And we can also see the illustration of how it would work. The actual paddle wheel itself was 15 feet wide and was made up of four 22 foot diameter spiders, which were a web-like iron arm and circle that looked like spokes on a wheel. Now, believe it or not, it's hard to see now, but the officer's quarters would have been in this region right in front of us. In fact, they slept separately from the enlisted men and they were on the gun deck on either side of the paddle wheel itself. Now again, because of the salvaging, it's hard to bring up everything. And so this region back here where we see that it's been reconstructed with newer materials, that's where the officers would have been. And you can only imagine that the officers would have had a slightly better accommodation than the enlisted men who probably were in bunks just in a standard row by row like other ships that we have seen. However, this is kind of a fascinating portion of this because it tells you a little bit more about the duty of the officer itself and how they had to be right there just in case something happened. They didn't even have the option to like come up a set of stairs. They needed to just be there and be able to execute orders immediately. As if you haven't figured out by now, this was an accomplishment of wonder and the USS Cairo or Cairo was actually named the National Historic mechanical engineering landmark list and you can see here that i think it explains itself this was a feat that was 
like no other and something that definitely changed the way that we look at modern day naval maneuvers. Okay, as we walk up the ramp, there's another sign here for us to look at. And this one's actually giving you kind of a cool overlook of the boat as a whole. And you can see where the layout really comes into play. From the level that we were looking at, it's very hard to even think about the overall size unless you're seeing people in reference to it. So as you're looking around, look at the people who are in here. Remember, there were hundreds of people on this ship at any given time. But here, we also have the history of the ship and its completion and the actual commanders who would have been in charge of this expensive vessel. The first sign that we stopped at was just right here and then you can come up a little bit more. This is all handicap accessible so you can easily come up and here you find out about how they were actually able to see on the gun deck and engine room. They, believe it or not they used skylights. So in the structure that we can see down here you can actually see where there are some areas that are slightly raised and there would be light coming through those to help them to be able to do the basic sight that they would need to do in order to inspect the paddle wheel or also in order for them to make basic maneuvers but that's not all they did they actually provided a way for some of the heat to escape the boat because during the summer months as you can imagine with boilers quite hot and the below deck areas would be almost so uncomfortable that it would be not a place that people would want to be despite having to be there so these would allow some of the heat to escape out of the boat in addition to providing that light source if you were to come here you would see the context of the boat itself learn about why it was so impressive but also the people themselves who brought this to light for us all. That video was incredible and it was super short. I definitely think that by seeing that, it puts the fact that this is in the place that it is in a lot different perspective. Just the act of pulling it from the waters almost 100 years after it had sank was quite a feat that involved a lot of people and one man even perished in his attempt to do so. This is a place of great astounding knowledge. And it's just a, one part of the larger picture as a whole, because the battlefield that this is positioned along has a story to tell that is also equally impressive. Vicksburg is a great place to come out and see some history. I've enjoyed it thoroughly, and I think you will too. Remember guys, we're not here for a long time, but we are here for a good time. Places like this definitely are that. Till next time guys, bye.